Hey everyone, Nick Russo here. This short video is the sequel to a previous video regarding my personal website after a few years of operation. If you haven't seen the first video, I'd suggest watching that first, and there's a link to it in the description below. Before I share the updates, I want to quickly review the high-level service chain. First, I make changes such as updating HTML text, adding new files, things like that. Then, I push those up into code commit, which is a remote Git repository. Basically, it's like GitHub except the AWS version. This push action kicks off a code pipeline run using code build to run tests and deploy my website resources to an S3 bucket. That bucket is accessible to the public over the internet at njrusmc.net. The DNS record is defined in Route 53, another AWS service. Each time my website is updated, I receive an email indicating whether the deployment succeeded or failed, along with a link to the build so I can check any errors if they happened. I detailed this process in depth during the previous video. In short, this is continuous integration and continuous deployment, or CICD, in a real-life scenario. This video will cover a few updates that I've recently made to my pipeline. First, I needed a more robust way to handle occasional web crawling failures. For example, there was a time when head requests sent to Pluralsight.com would intermittently fail or timeout, but GET requests would always work. I didn't want to switch to GET requests exclusively, so I added some fallback logic for these failures. Other sites occasionally gave me a 500 series error indicating a server problem, which was often cleared up by the time I ran the web crawler again. Last, I wanted to ensure that any HTTP redirects were being followed to ensure the resource in question was actually reachable. I also added a new feature to my website. I created a bunch of test files with various cache control headers, which allows people to test HTTP caching and optimization techniques for free. I personally use this in some of my professional courses and wanted to provide safe and reliable resources for everyone else to test. In order to ensure that this works and is reliable, I had to write some additional automated tests. My website testing and deployment process still has four main steps. We install all required packages, then run pre-build tests such as linting, hash generation, atom file generation for blog subscribers, and hyperlink validation. Then, the code is deployed to production by copying it to the S3 bucket, and the web crawler executes once more, targeting the live website. I've written another Python script to test my HTTP cache test files for the proper cache control headers. This is the newest and final step in the deployment pipeline. We'll explore that script, as well as web crawler updates, next. We're currently in the root directory of my website, and let's first look at the CI scripts directory in greater depth. You should be familiar with the checklinks.py script since we reviewed that in the previous video, but we'll also look at the checkcacheheaders.py script as well. Let's start with the check links so you can see the minor updates I made there. Again, we're only going to focus on the updates. These three constants are all new. These can control how to handle timeouts and retries when we're dealing with requests. After 20 seconds of no response, we'll mark a request as timed out. When timeout and other failures occur, we'll retry up to five times. That's what attempts is for. Last, in order to pace our attempts, we'll sleep for five seconds in between each attempt. That's what the wait sec is for. You'll be seeing me reference these constants pretty soon. This part of the code is all new. The old version used to just do request.head, and that was it. This time, we are going to wrap that first head request in a try accept block. If a read timeout error is raised, we'll catch that and then set head response to none. This means that the program won't crash when a timeout occurs, but we'll have to manually handle this error checking later in the script. There's two other keyword arguments that are new. First, I'm setting the timeout keyword argument to our timeout constant, which if you remember, was 20 seconds. I'm also enabling allow redirects. Now this is usually set to true for GET requests, and you can override it to false, but with head requests, it's the opposite. I want to ensure that if any of my links get redirected, maybe some of the blogs that I reference from my friends are going to new URLs, I want to make sure we actually follow that to see the content. 
This is a little bit slower since it's going to ultimately result in more requests if there are redirects, but it's generally worth it to avoid having any dead links on my site. Next we have an if statement that is checking to ensure that head response is defined and that it's okay. If either of those conditions is false, we'll print a failure string and then attempt to do some get requests. We'll set a success flag to false, then iterate five times issuing a get request each iteration. This is where the attempts constant comes into play. For each get request, if it succeeded, we'll set success to true and break out of the loop. We don't need to keep retrying once we get a valid response. However, if it wasn't okay, we'll print a failure message, sleep for five seconds, and then loop again. The reason we sleep in between requests is just for pacing, which helps avoid any rapid 500 series errors that might happen. Again, I don't have a great explanation as to why it happens, but I found that just by issuing the same request a few times over and over, this can be enough to overcome some server errors that I've seen with the links on my site. If you want to see what this output looks like, I've included a callout. Suppose that the head request fails to this automating Python course, and then we have to do two GET requests by the time it succeeds. This isn't very common, especially today, but about a year ago this used to happen every time. I got really frustrated because all of my CI CD builds kept failing and I kept having to manually troubleshoot, which is completely counter to the whole idea of this automated system. That wraps up the updates for the check link script, so let's move on to talk about caching. The cache testing files are stored in the cache directory, so let's take a quick look at those. There's a mix of different files here, and we'll talk more about those later. More importantly, let's look at how they are processed, since the file names by themselves might be a little confusing. We can do that with the check cache header script that we saw earlier when we looked inside the CI scripts directory. I'll open that file next. Regarding the import statements, I'm importing sys so that we can exit from the program with a custom return code, which I'll explain shortly. Of course, we also need to import requests for HTTP client functionality. Let's jump into the main function to see how the script actually works. First, let's define a base URL, which is the prefix for all the different files we just saw in that directory. Then we'll define a file dictionary, which maps file names as the keys to the expected cache control header string. When a file should not have a cache control header string, we just set it to none. For example, this file is all zeros, it's 128 kilobytes, and it should have the cache control header string of public and a max age of 60 seconds. These zero files are just null values and are easily compressed since all the data is the same. The random files are just random data, as you can probably guess, and these are harder to compress. There's also a large variety of different cache control headers, so you can test whichever case you want. Since all requests are going to the same site, we can open a requests session to get slightly better performance. This will allow the TCP session to remain up instead of having to create a new one for each request. We also want to count failures to use this as a return code, so we'll start it at zero. If failures is anything other than zero, the script will be considered a failure by the CI CD engine, which is exactly what we want. We'll iterate over the dictionary by unpacking the keys and values together using the items function, then print a status message for each file we see. This general logic is kind of similar to the web crawler so that we can see what's happening as the script runs. We'll then issue a head request to the base URL plus the file name. I'm combining these together in an F string and here's what that final product might look like. If the CC header value evaluates to true, basically it's not none and not the empty string, then we're going to test for a match. We want to ensure that the cache control header on the file is exactly equal to the cache control header we specified. If it is, we'll print OK and then loop again. If it's not, this is a failure, so we'll indicate that to the console and also increment the failure counter. The reason I don't raise exceptions here, as opposed to check links, is that this process is extremely fast. The check links can run in multiple minutes, and I may not want to do that if there's failures early in the process. I want to fail faster. Because this is very fast, it's easier just to check all the files at once and then make any corrections in a single effort when I log in. Suppose a cache control header was not specified, such as in the cases where the value in that dictionary was set to none. In those cases, we'll explicitly test for the absence of a key. We're asking the question, 
If cache control as a key is not in the response headers dictionary, that's good. That's a success. However, if it is present, regardless of the value that it has, that's a failure and will increment the counter as a result. When the loop is finished running, we'll exit the program passing in the failure count as the return code. Remember, only zero means success, so any number greater than zero will signify an error. Let's quickly run the script to ensure that it's actually working on my live website right now. The output's pretty simple. We can see each file being evaluated for the proper headers and then OK at the end. Let's also check the return code to ensure that it's zero in this case. All right, that looks pretty good to me. The last file I had to modify was the buildspec.yaml. This is the file that tells the CI CD engine how to run and what the different steps are. Let's look at that file next. The first change I made to this file is under the build phase. In addition to not including the git repository files or the git ignore file, I also need to exclude all those cache testing files. This is an imperfect solution and I'm still looking for a better way to do it. But in summary, when you copy a new file to S3, it will override any of the headers that you've set on those files. I want to ensure that those cache control headers are retained, not overwritten, so I'm not going to copy these files over. In addition to not overwriting the cache files, we need to add our cache header testing to our post build process. Notice that we didn't update the make file as part of the pre build process because it doesn't make sense to check these files before the deployment. The files themselves aren't being checked, only the HTTP headers, so it only makes sense in the context of checking a live website. As I said in the slides, we'll run that step last, so it should occur at the very end of our log file. Let's open up a web browser so we can check those logs, as well as look at the files on the website and any other details that might be interesting. In the previous video, we looked at these logs in more detail, but this time I just scrolled to the bottom of my most recent update. Just like we saw on the terminal, all of the cache control headers are set correctly on all these different files, and the build succeeded. As a tip, it's usually a good idea to go and manually check the logs from your build system to ensure that your changes to your pipeline actually worked. It's easy to forget to do this, so just be vigilant and pay attention to what your build process is actually doing. In the next tab, I have S3 open so we can look at these files in more depth. I've already navigated to the cache directory, and towards the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the files. Let's look at the date modified column first. You can see that the cache.html file, which is basically the web page itself, was updated on September 25th. However, all of the test files in the directory were updated a week earlier. That's because these files don't get updated on every push, per our rule that we added to our build spec file. That's exactly what we want because each one of these files has a custom cache control header which is set through the file's metadata. As an example, let's explore the file at the bottom of the screen. Once we highlight it, let's drop down the Actions menu. Then click on Change Metadata. This metadata is a fancy way of identifying the HTTP server headers. In this case, the content type is an octet stream, basically a binary file, which you'd expect. AWS was smart enough to specify that for me, so I didn't have to do this manually. However, the cache control header is something I did specify, and you can see that the value is exactly equal to what I said it should be in the script. I repeated this process for every file in the directory, giving us the diversity of files we need for testing. Last, let's go to my website to see the final product. I've added a new menu option called HTTP Cache Testing, so let's check that first. As you probably expected from me at this point, I just listed the files in a simple format so people can download each one. You could try using your browser and then checking your temporary internet files to see how caching works that way, or you could do it programmatically using requests like I did in the script. You don't have to use requests. There are other libraries in other languages too, but these files are public and free to use. I only ask that you don't denial of service attack me by downloading the file every second because that's going to cost me a lot of money. So please be respectful and enjoy this free product. Let's head back to the main page. I talked about this in the previous video, but let's also take a look at our CICD files. I'll scroll to the bottom. At the very bottom, I've added a link to the check cache headers.py script. If you want to explore that script in greater detail, or maybe run it on your own, or modify it for your own use, be my guest. 
As I explained earlier, my entire CI process is free, so feel free to manipulate or borrow any of these files. Okay, that wraps things up for this video. I hope you found this content useful and interesting. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you.